Hi, it's Richard and welcome to the Conscious Marketer podcast. We're so glad you're joining us here today. And uh, we have a special treat. We're gonna be speaking with Cassie Klauser. She is known, also known as the brand mythologist and she helps company create uh, inspiring impressions through bold story driven branding and graphic design. Really what she's gonna be sharing with us is this kind of this process of visual storytelling, which is, and story is code, which are both, both very interesting topics. So hi, Cassie, how are you doing today? Hi, Richard. Um, I am happy and grateful to be on this podcast with you. So thank you for having me. Uh, I'm doing well today. Yes, uh, along those lines of who I am and where I've come from and how I'm here today. Uh, quick summary, uh, my first career was in music. Okay. Um, so always a creative and always carving my own path. There's a, a grand piano behind her. So were you a pianist? Is that right? Or Yes. So I majored in piano performance and you know, I dared to do the thing. I made a career out of music, you know, gigging and, you know, the buffet of items of, you know, creating a living through being creative. And many years in, I, uh, there was a tipping point where I was doing so much, I injured both of my hands. Uh, uh, both hands and wrists had tendonitis and my career and ego, all of that just, you know, is that a pretty injury. common thing? I know I, I've worked with another violinist who um, also helps people overcome injuries because of all the practice time. Yes, actually, it is common. Um, and so, um, you know, reading the signs for when that's about to happen is, you know, listen to the signs <laughs> and, um, you know, great appreciation for those who train in a way uh, to help people recover or prevent injury. Um, right. So yes, anyway, so that was a uh, a dissolving of ego, and I took a year off, and I needed to find a new create a new career, which in which I could still be creative and right. make a living. Right. Um, and that was in design. And so um, that was about seven or eight years ago. I. Um, I, I dove in full force and that was my full-time job was learning how to design. Right. And, um, so since then, so it's been about seven or eight years, I moved from a lot of agency work to where now I'm out on my own and, um, you know, found, finding more deeper and more powerful angles of creativity and branding that continues to make my work exciting and meaningful. Right. Could you um, maybe explain to everybody what it means to kind of have um, like have a visual story? Well, what is visual storytelling? Can you define that for all of us so that we kind of have a deeper sense of like your your work? Yes. So there's visual storytelling as a whole and all those definitions that it can be. And then there's what people tend to be the type of visual storytelling that people tend to be drawn to me for. So I'll go kind of through through both of those. So we have different senses through which we perceive the world and we build our reality. Um, visual, auditory, hearing, kinesthetic, feeling. Um, we have uh, gustatory, we have olfactory, we have intuitive and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the the usual five senses that most people um, think of when they think of the senses, the visual is the fastest communication perception or mechanism for us to receive information. Right. Um, auditory is somewhere in the middle and kinesthetic, the feeling is tends to be the slowest. Um, so when we say visual storytelling, it's um, it is the process of communicating information through a visual sense. Um, so, and that not doesn't necessarily have to be the uh, the outer eye. That can also include the inner eye. Um, and Richard, we were talking a little bit ago about visual storytelling through podcasts and radio, and that right. it is possible to paint 
pictures, I'm doing it right now, um, for us to see something by using the voice. Okay, so there's that fundamental using the visual sense and those those type of mechanisms. How do we see it uh, today? We see it in images, we see it in video, um, we can see it through words by stimulating those senses. Um, and so- Well, it's interesting because I think you could be listening to somebody that maybe wasn't aware of what they were creating in somebody else's mind and they might be less effective, but maybe through visual storytelling, you can really figure out what you actually want other people to be imagining or seeing uh, when they listen to you. So do you help people do that with their brands and their and their personalities and things like that? Yes. And so that leads to what do people normally come to me for with visual brand storytelling? And so I heard a couple of things in your question there. One is the ability, my ability or visual storytellers ability to consciously create images and visions and brands that quickly communicate story on a deep level to their audience. And um, so I, uh, I work mostly in the digital world. Uh, and so with, uh, through brand identity, through um, website design, all of that happens after there has been a lot of work done in tapping into the business or the, if it's a personal brand, the person's story. And then the job is, how do we then paint the right stories in their materials? Um, so that tends to be one of my, my strengths is being able to communicate uh, a story in an image. Um, and, you know, how do you communicate story in an image is that's I think that's another question. Um, well, what, what are some of the like if you were to say, OK, here are three things to look out for. Like what what would you say is good visual story brand storytelling? What, would, what, what can you give some ideas for our listeners what they might be thinking of? Like because I because th we do a lot of like, say, sales pages or, you know, the top section of a of a website. If you haven't been to. Uh, if you want to check out something really awesome, go to the brand mythologist and see like right when you hit her site, there's a there's an image there and you're going to want to see it because she kind of lives what you 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 teach. So could you give us some ideas on what you would suggest? Ah, uh, yes. So you point out if we're going to a website, that first image in terms of the website, that is that's king or queen, right? To quickly within one to seven seconds, tell a story. Um, and so in thinking about your audience who's listening right now, Richard, um, might be in line with mine. Um, and I say this because audience is important. So who you're talking to is the most important. Where I tend to serve people who are Yodas in disguise or, or not so much in disguise. Um, people who are making vast social change, both literally and metaphorically. So one, one element of good visual brand storytelling that really aligns with these audiences is evoking emotion and evoking the right emotion. If I can create a visual piece that matches the feeling that we want the brand to immediately evoke, that's good. Um, for, for example, I, um, I do branding work and uh, graphic website design work with one of the largest civil rights nonprofits in the country. Okay. Um, and it was, it's been my job over the past year to rebrand them. I mean, that's a, it's a big task. Um, and what did they want their audience to feel that was different than before that my art creates visually? Um, and that is the feeling of belonging and mobilization. And so being able to put, I, I call some of these pieces, visual pieces, composites. So I tell stories visually in one image by putting together multiple symbols. Um, 
And so, for example, their their new homepage, their visual, I have composites of um, black group organizations marching. I have they wanted to speak to the young audience as well, because that previously they felt that they were speaking too much to an older audience. They want multi-generational, multi-gender. So I have that mix. I have I'm bringing in a microphone and I'm just creating this energetic piece of join this movement. Picture yourself here. Let's go. We're ready to do the work Right. that communicates faster than reading the whole paragraph that goes with it. Right. Um, So that's an example. Um, Now, there are other types of visual storytelling that might not be our audience's go-to, and it it might be, um, is uh, actually going more left brain um, and using visual storytelling to explain or to increase understanding, Mm -hmm. to educate. Um, And so that's something that I'm continually reminding my clients is that we're mixing both right and left. so that we're both creating emotion and understanding so that they can qualify or disqualify. Right. Um, uh, well, I think it's interesting because, you know, because sometimes, you know, because we, we both run agencies and a lot of times a client will come to us and say, hey, I want to launch this product. Um, and they, they might have been, they might already be down the road in having created it. Um, but then as you start to ask maybe some deeper questions, you sometimes, and not always, but sometimes you find that they haven't thought through the higher level strategy or what they want to achieve or what they want to express. So although people come to us for launches, we end up doing a lot of strategy work. So it sounds like that might be the case for you too, where they come in and say, Hey, we want to do a brand reinvention, but then you kind of have to kind of go back to some core principles. What, what would be some things that you work with your clients are to just get clear on how like what what those symbols are for their brand and what image they would select do you take them through a process or how do you work i do um so that is one of the biggest shifts that i've made as a creative in branding and sales is the great importance of turning a client's or a company's unconscious knowledge and making it conscious first before we step into any visuals and art. Right. And, um, you know, as well as really understanding their audience. So I have, um, I have a process that I take my clients through and with each one, I tweak it a little bit differently depending on what their strengths are because you might have a writer come in who it's like things just slip off the tongue. They're just ready to go. Or you might have someone who's very auditory that we work through to draw out. Um, So I use a storytelling approach in my process that leads up to design. Okay. Um, Yeah. So we're bringing out many different types of stories. um, And I have a, a few different phases of that exchange of information where in the beginning, it's just download. I'm drawing out as much as I can. And then there's this point of beautiful confusion that happens where the upload starts coming through and we have the right stories that need to be told, the feelings, the values, the, um, you know, what is so difficult to say no to that is bringing so much value to their audience right. um, before uh, that's, you know, for clients who are have the time and are willing to go through that thorough, meaningful process. Um, it's essential to good storytelling. Yeah, I, I love the idea of um, kind of drawing out the stories and um you know, a lot of times people don't understand the uh, importance of uh, storytelling in their brand. Could you share a little bit more about what makes a good story uh, from your perspective and which mm-hmm. stories really help build brands or build personalities? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so from that storytelling point of view in in branding, so I know we've talked about a couple of different contexts. So we've talked about brands as a whole. Yep. And you've mentioned things like a sales page or for a product or a service, which I tend to treat that as a different beast. <laughs> um, so what what makes for good a visual brand storytelling or brand storytelling um, is one that um, we're speaking to their audience. And um, I find that many people come to me and they know themselves inside and out, but their greatest challenge is understanding how to find the similarities across their their audience because they may think, well, I have so many different types of people in my audience. Right. And that's our challenge is finding the archetypes of experience, the archetypes of the, the common journey, the common desires, the common needs that actually show up as common in the what people perceive as different audience. Um, so are we speaking to the desires and needs? Um, are we are we recognizing the audience's problem, right? So um, I often use the uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Um, I know it's a, it's a pretty common uh, template, so to say, that people use in brand storytelling. It's by no means the only, and it's by no means what you should follow exactly. But it's a, it's a nice archetype, right? So, um, you know, are we, what we call pacing and leading. Are we meeting people where they're at? Right. Are we representing their challenges? Are we representing what their desires are? Are we representing their how to overcome their objections? Are we building trust? Are we painting the story of what life might be like if you purchase this product, if you uh, go with this service, right? And so um, it's tapping into the right template, so to say, of story that both intellectually and kinesthetically or intuitively feels good. Because sometimes I'll follow that template of the hero's journey and I'll show it to a client and we're like, okay, this feels weird. And so we go into puzzle mode and I'll, for example, if we have a sales page, I'll break down all my designs into puzzle pieces and digitally, and then we'll move them around. And so I encourage like creating the mold and then breaking the mold into feeling what feels good when you're telling the story. Does that make sense? Is your sto story not regurgitated, right? If you're copying someone else's story, it's probably not the right story. Um, so it's, digging and digging to find that original authentic story that's going to come through that when right. you read it you you just feel it you feel yeah. it in your body and so i don't know how to explain <laughs> that part um but it's it's powerful well i think a lot of great graphic designers or storytellers they they can tap into that feeling and we're teaching a group uh we the group's called the accelerator and um, kind of one of the final checks on our, our, you know, on their offer is like, how does, how does each section feel? You know, that's one of the questions we ask. And, um, you know, the, because some of the pages can be quite long. I always say like, go through and that thing that's kind of niggled you every time you get to that part of the page, it could be the headline or the, the button color or the bullet points. Like when you're doing that final check, that's, that's the time to dial everything in, you know? Um, and for me, I, th I think I'm probably, I think I have a strong kinesthetic feeling because when I go through pages, I like feel it in my body, you know, because <laughs> we do so many launches, <laughs> but it's nice to hear you uh, reflect that back, that that's an important aspect because, because that's one of the ways that we, we teach people. And then also it's the way kind of how I go through pages myself. Um, I want to switch topics for just a little bit here. This has been really great. Um, you have this concept of story as code. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by that? I'm, I'm quite intrigued. 
Yes, and so when when I use the phrase story is code, I'm I'm not using it flippantly or as a trend because I'm actually seeing the word code as a trend. So I want to disclaim that off the bat here. Um, so, okay, let's talk about what is code first. Uh, so to have a code, we need three pieces. So we need an encoder, we need a code, and we need a decoder. So an encoder is we put in information. Well, if you think about binary code, right? Zeros and ones, so we're thinking about a computer. Um, we put in uh, zeros and ones, okay? And uh, that equals a certain letter, right? So that equals A. Um, so let's say we press an A on our keyboard, and I don't recall the exact numbers, you might know them, <laughs> but it puts in zeros and ones, it, it communicates uh, the code, and then the computer decodes that in the ver reverse way, right? This series of zeros and ones equals A, and then it reflects us to us back on the screen. Right. Um, so that's a modern version of code, um, and um, though code itself is not limited to our modern age, um, code is has been with us since I believe the the very beginning of life, and we can find that in our DNA. So you might hear that a lot too, DNA and code, right? So imagine that we have this um, we have this fetus that is that has DNA that has this sort of meta level code to to grow and evolve over its own life. And in fact, it's quite it's, remarkable, really, if you think about it, you know, the amount of code and the, the sophistication of that that code, that's just a natural part of our life. Yes. Um, so you can fact check me on this one, but I think that the human has 300 billion uh, base pairs. Um, if that's incorrect, please edit it out. So where um, a protozoa has about 500,000. So even with a single celled organism, just that blows my mind that, um, you know, we have these, um, these groups of, um, we have codons that then translate into enzymes and proteins and then it's a symbol for when these are together body do this life do this um and so we have ancient and modern versions of code where we have something that isn't the thing so we have a series of zeros and ones that isn't the letter so that's that's what i mean by a symbol where the DNA itself is not the nose. Okay. Right. So when we talk or when I talk about story as code, from a communications point of view, story as an information system filled with symbols and associations that contain information that are at a that are not the thing, right? They're at a distance from people and yet we can encode a symbol into a story and the person on the other side can decode that. Right. Um, and so in this way, um, story is a way to pass information from different experiences with right. common symbolism. Okay. Yeah. And every, you know, every story is has a different code and then uh, has different meaning for different people. So it's it's kind of fascinating. Um, it kind of reminds me because when we were launching a recent program, uh, I used to own a VW bus, kind of an orange 72. It was a really beautiful one. Um, but I sold it before we moved. We live in Maine now, which is a little bit too cold for that bus here. But I had all these pictures and I was like, for this launch, it just doesn't match this launch. And so I was kind of like searching well, what other thing would what other uh, vehicle or, or symbol would match what I'm trying to do inside the program. And I landed on uh, we had kind of a neon theme going, uh, which 
was it's a little more fresh, a little more energetic. And I landed on uh, an Airstream because it kind of matched the um, the neon theme. But for me, the Airstream uh, represented kind of freedom. And uh, through online courses and things, we were I, I wanted to represent to my audience that by getting your your work into the world and serving more people, you you would have more freedom, and you'd also help other people more have more freedom. So um, now it, now when I put it on the page, I was like, okay, this, that really fits; it's perfect. But it's not like I I etched freedom into the side of that thing or whatever. I had to I had to kind of lean into the fact that when a lot of people see an airstream, they think, oh, that's a luxury vehicle that you could take anywhere and still you know kind of be in style but um you know so it, it encoded that idea so it had to, like it's like that that airstream had a code has a code in the collective consciousness about what it stands for if you own one you know so i don't know if that if that uh connects with what you're saying in terms of code but uh, when you were talking that's kind of what came up for me Yes, exactly. Especially when we are working with people, organizations that are in the world of the abstract. Right. Um, finding tangible symbols that then can be interpreted in a way that is personal to each person um, or is a common association. So let's say I might not have ever experienced this vehicle or object myself, I can still gather enough information with my experience what that might mean for me. Um, and um, so at a very tangible level, that's one example of using story is a physical symbol for a quality or trait. So Cassie, you know, we're, we're all out there, we're trying to do good things and serve people. How can you use storytelling and visual brand storytelling to make your brand aspirational so that you can attract your perfect clients in, in an authentic way, in a way that's not manipulative, in a way that's aligned with uh, deeper values of being of service in the world? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a great question, and it's something that's been on my mind recently in just watching the the market of coaching and um, sacred business. And, you know, I find that um, my clients in those areas want to be real. Right. And they want to be of value. And so I think before anything, finding that sense of immense value that you you know is worth so much to the people that you want to work with because i think that if you don't feel it first to manufacture it through good design is kind of like putting a band-aid on something deeper you know so um you know and i even struggled that with with myself um you know a few years ago I was driving down the uh, you know main road of lots of businesses, and I saw billboard after billboard, and um, I actually felt really nauseous. And I felt like, what the heck am I doing? I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to be part of this inundation of buy this, do this. Um, and so I actually had a bit of a down phase where I said, okay, I'm. I'm just going to chill a little bit until I find what's real for me. Right. Um, till I find what is my unique purpose. Why should I market? What's right. the point? Um, and so over time, um, that sort of letting go of needing to be part of something that I didn't want helped to then bring through intelligence of what my value is. Um, and so, I mean, I get it. it. Like I, I scroll through Facebook and I see, because I research a lot of coaches, guess what? Tons of ads for coaches show up in my feed and that same, some of them feel real, but a lot of them, I feel like we were talking about the kinesthetic response. I feel the no and what can we do to get authentic for, right. for each person? And so so what are some tools then, right? So we talked about we have to find it to the point where 
the client feels it. Right. And then um, through our process, we're not necessarily settling on the first thing. Right. Often the first thing is repeated from our experience. So I think it's the willingness to keep going and keep refining or digging until we find the message that gives the goosebumps or the offer that gives the goosebumps or that, that warmth. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, that's, that's said really well. And I think, I think what's interesting is because so many people don't do that when you, when you actually find that sweet spot, when you find that warmth and you come from that deeper place, people do feel it. They do feel it kinesthetically. They do get, if you're real. And then, you know, the, the proof is actually who you serve because if they start to support you and spread you, then, then it's just a, then you'll grow naturally, you know? So like my guess is now that you've settled into that, you don't have any lack of clients, right? Because people are recommending you and you have your wait list, right? <laughs> so that, yeah. That, 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 yeah, then you have to decide, okay, do I want to grow? Do I want to hire people or do I want to keep it small? And that's another decision, you know? Yes. And um, so even though I do these types of services for my clients, I don't do very much marketing. I When I started out, you know, flying the nest of uh, being behind the scenes in an agency to going off on my own, um, that was really scary because I'm a single mom. Right. But I valued mom being awake and excited on and on fire than finding the secure thing and maybe I'm not very happy, you know. Right. So, um, but over time, I, you know, I'm to the point now just through the quality of my service that, you know, my business is 100% referrals with a wait list right now, and I'm deciding how to grow. So, um, and that's, that's from drawing in, right? It's from be, you're talking about that kinesthetic feeling that you, that you find other people feel it. It's magnetic rather than, um, seeing people as targets, so to say. Well, this has been an amazing call. I can, I can, I can feel, uh, I have a teacher that says, I can feel you feeling me, which I think is really an interesting statement. Um, but I can feel your deep care for making the world a better place. And also, uh, you know, for your clients, cause I, cause you bring yourself and everything you have to your clients to make that happen. So thanks so much for, um sharing more about uh, marketing is code and branding is code and more about visual brand storytelling it's been a lot of uh interesting concepts i know the next time i'm creating i'm gonna think back to this episode and think what well, what would cassie do in this situation <laughs> <laughs> and uh maybe there's something we could work together on in the future i think i think that that would be a lot of fun too if uh you're listening um to this on iPods or Spotify or, or iTunes or Spotify or Amazon or whatever service, uh, give us a like. And if you want to learn more about Cassie, you can go to thebrandmythologist.com and she has a list of services and you can find out all, all about her there. We uh, th thank you, Cassie, for being on our show today. It's been a real pleasure. Yes. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Enjoy. And we look forward to being in a relationship in the future. And thanks to all the listeners listening in. We'll see you on the next episode of the Conscious Marketer podcast. Thank you.